<laughs> oh, uh, hey guys, welcome to another episode of Reseller Information Network. Sorry, I had you muted there for a second, but we're back and we are live today. Couple things going on. Uh, first of all, if you are here with us supporting, we appreciate you so much. We actually hit our first little milestone when it comes to Reseller Information Network. We have hit the 1K. We're there. We, we've made it to the first big hurdle of YouTube. Uh, we, we have passed that bar, and now we're moving forward. So still, if you're out there and you're not subscribed, I don't know why not at this point. I don't know why why not. Just go ahead and, and hit that button. Take care of that. Go ahead and hit the bell. We're dropping now every Friday with this pre-recorded session. If you want to come and hang out with us on Tuesdays, 9.30 a.m., be there. We're there through the day working, hanging out, answering questions, just showing you the grind of reselling really is what we do on Tuesdays and then dropping some shorts throughout the week. We appreciate so much all the support that we've got from the community. And man, a couple people I want to recognize this week before I get into the intros is you guys have dropped some comments and we appreciate that so much. Uh, first comment comes from RKMW says, love you guys. Tim is hilarious. A whole bunch of knowledge on here for experienced and new resellers. I know I've picked up some tips. Kudos to the whole gang from Nova Scotia, Canada. Keep up the great work. P.S. Old School Picker sent me. Man, RKMW, we appreciate you so much for being here. And we thank you for being a part of our little reselling world. Uh, Sal's McCarty, McCarty, McCarty. I don't know. I'm butchering that. Sorry, Sal. Sal, the big gun guy, my friend, <laughs> says, gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this channel, taking the time to do so. When I started reselling one and a half years ago, I wish this was out when I started. New resellers, soak it up. It's 100% free. Stay humble and kind. Thank you, Sal. We appreciate you watching. So now let's get to our panel for today. We have my man, Jimmy, Old School Flips, also known as Old School Resell, also known as one of the most hated resellers on TikTok. <laughs> watch his videos. So Jimmy. What's yeah. going on, everybody? <laughs> yeah, I am definitely one of the most hated TikTokers on, on the category of reselling. Um, I wanted to bring up Old School Resell, my new channel, and I'm going to shamelessly promote it because I'm going through the stuff I'm selling, and I'm like, hey, I learned about this from Tim. Hey, I learned about this from Turnock. That's why this channel is so great, guys. I'm learning this stuff with these guys that I'm co-hosting with while I'm doing this show. I literally in the show, I was like, I learned about this jacket from Turnock. Like, that's what's great about this show. Come check out, subscribe, and you'll learn a lot from these guys. Awesome. You know, next up, we have my man. You talk about learning stuff. Like, I think most of the reseller community could probably, if you know, when you when you talk about sports, you talk about coaching trees, right? Uh, when you talk about vintage clothing, snapback hats, we've got Sir Snapback in the building, the ultimate hat camp director. What's going on, everybody? Yeah, man, we just got back from a crazy vintage expo and we. We killed it over there. I mean, we're always searching for crazy items. Found more stuff today. Always finding stuff every single day. Always learning. Always just just trying to find the coolest stuff to bring to everybody and to hunt. And uh, I got some cool things to show y'all today as well. So uh, just kind of like picking out of my brain. So uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you everyone for the support. Hundred uh, uh, thousand subs. That's awesome. Uh, you know, excited about that. So and we're just going to keep going. You guys, listen, my, my little thing today, it's just, it's like a tip of the iceberg. It's a deep dive, but it's a tip of the iceberg when it comes to, uh, you know, all the knowledge that we have. So, uh, but yeah, I want to thank Eric and everyone for having me on today as well. So. There you go. Always appreciated. And we know there is a depth and a, a deep, well of knowledge with it when it comes to what these guys are bringing to the table. And, and one of those, you know, obviously you heard Tim is hilarious. We all know that. Uh, but man, obviously I've, I've given him the kudos on the 7-Eleven points. 
we know this guy can pack glass like no, nobody else and sells all kinds of stuff. If you missed last week's episode, you missed out on the swung. Is that right? Swung, swung glass vases. vases. Man, I mean, for me, I'm out at the yard sale this past week looking because of Tim. So, Tim, what's going on, man? Nothing much. You know, just uh, another day in paradise. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, congratulations to everybody uh, here at the Reseller Information Network that we have crossed that 1,000 subscriber mark. And shout out to everybody who has subscribed. Shout out to everybody who has dropped questions um, in the comment sections of these videos. Remember, this is a show that is not about us. It is about you. Uh, so we're super excited to be able to continue to bring you guys information for free that you guys can use to help uh, grow your reselling uh, network and channel or business. So shout out to you guys for helping us cross that border. And it is that time of the show where I give everybody an update on the uh, total 7-Eleven points. Speaking of milestones, we have, I don't know if I crossed this threshold last time. If I did, I didn't realize it, so I'm going to say it again. But we have crossed the 95,000 wow. point total at 7-Eleven. We are now at 95,570 7-Eleven points. And you know what's crazy? I didn't even realize this because there's not a lot of 7-Eleven uh, gas stations where I live at. But when I was at the flea market on Saturday... I went to the 7-Eleven, you know, I had to get some 7-Eleven donuts and some Celsius and get my, you know, breakfast of reselling champions. And I realized I get 11 cents off of the gallon at 7-Eleven gas stations. So oh. I was super stoked. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, shout out to 7-Eleven for that 11 cent uh, off the gallon discount price. I did put that into effect on Saturday while I was out picking. So, yeah, um, I'm super excited about today. I'm super excited about every time I get an opportunity to, um, you know, share the screen with uh, these awesome people. We have an awesome guest today as well. And shout out to uh, Leroy, who's not with us right now at this second. We love you, buddy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're super excited about today's episode. Yeah. We will forewarn you guys. Like it seems like in in our little world of reselling, the listing and loafing crew, uh, we we've had a bad run of illness kind of running through all of us. So, uh, Katie, I'll just forewarn you. Like if you come by, I've been, like, I've been good. I mean, I'm a little yeah. sick in the head always, but you know, I'm, I'm been I've been pretty good. So I'm knocking on all the wood around me. Fingers are crossed. A little ash on the forehead if I got yeah. to, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think Jimmy brought back something from out there at West Coast when it went back to the show. You know, kind of put us on the on the thing. But like like uh, Tim said, Leroy obviously is not with us today um, in person, but he will be dropping a reseller hack in this episode, so you won't want to miss that. And, but we do have with us today. I got the opportunity to hang out with this young lady at uh, Prison to Profit. Uh, got to to do a little sourcing with her actually, and man, I learned a ton of stuff in about the five minutes that we stood at the bookshelf. That's about all I could take. I had to go try to go. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a good five more. minutes. But but we were looking. I learned so much, and and you know I've been checking out her uh, her stuff in preparation for her coming on. And man, Katie, we are so happy to have you with us today. So just give a little intro. Well, guys, my name is Katie. I run Katie Reads on YouTube, Instagram, all the social media. Uh, back in 2019, I just kind of randomly decided decided to start selling used books. Um, I'm a book person. Uh, I've read and I even write some short stories, so I'm self-published as well. So books is what I know, so I dove into what I know and kind of found a mission in it because I found out that a lot of schools and colleges literally are throwing books in the dumpster because they don't have anywhere else to take them. So I run a free book pickup service in my local county area, and that's how I was able to get capital to um, further my business um, is through the th free inventory that I've been able to get. I still continue the service, but now I'm able to also thrift as well and do things like that over the years. My business has been able to grow and now I am full time reselling. Um, so I get to be home with the kids with pay, and, um, you know, have have the freedoms and um, 
it's all on me now. It's all on me to figure out, you know, what, what paycheck is coming next. And it's kind of exciting, kind of scary, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a journey and, uh, I I'm really enjoying it. And so I've been on YouTube, uh, a little over a year. Um, and that has been really fun. I wanted to kind of get my feet wet before I started getting on YouTube acting like I know what I'm talking about. And sometimes I still don't know what I'm talking about, but, um, I think I've been able to help quite a few people. And, uh, yeah, I just am really, really deep into the book game. I do sell other things, but my channel is exclusively talking about books and specifically eBay. Um, there's a lot of Amazon content out there with books. So a lot of people don't talk about eBay or other reselling platforms that you can sell books on. Um, so I talk a lot about that specifically. Man, we are so pleased to have her with us today. Uh, you know, most of the time we, we do have like... <laughs> all of us we've known each other for like two years and uh i actually went back we had somebody comment on the channel like how come you don't have any females on the panel uh i'll answer that in a very short thing uh two years ago i decided to do a listing day challenge and i did it for eight hours all of the guys that are on the uh listing and loafing crew those guys and, and i will tell you tim in particular is a big reason why we're here uh, because Tim reached out to me, he said, dude, that was so inspiring uh, to to get on there and list that day. And like, I need some some accountability. I need some help with doing that. And he did that. And then it was like one by one, all the guys that are on the listing and loafing crew, they reached out to me and said, hey, I want to be a part of this. And we started doing this like almost two years ago. Like, so we've really gotten to know each other over the years. Guys, it's not that we have anything against females. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we uh, we you know appreciate all those that are in the reselling community. And uh, but man, it is nice to get a different perspective from things. I've really enjoyed uh, people like the Let's Do Lunch uh, podcast. You know, I, I've been over there, been listening to their stuff. We're, we're maybe something in the works in the future with that. But you know, guys, it's just a matter of we we came together and we're together. And that's just what it is. But it's nice to have Katie in with us today, kind of keeping us all straight. You know, yes. and I, I do I do want to say one thing that I do want to give a big shout out to Katie because I will tell you personally, I was an I was a hater on reselling books. And <laughs> she completely changed my mind on that. Wow. And yes, I do. Cause like, I, I want to make sure that I say that out loud, you know what I'm saying? So people really know wow. because I was, I was, I was like, there's no way, you know? And then, so like, I, I have, uh, I have seen a lot of that of her work and it's very interesting. And I do want to say that this is always about opening up your mind. Cause you know, like I deal in glass, a lot of people won't deal with glass, you know, like mm -hmm. she deals in books. A lot of people won't deal with books. And I think that it's also super interesting that she brought up the point about, you know, there's a lot of Amazon stuff when it comes to books. And I think it is important for people to understand and to, to hear what she has to say about, you know, the other avenues of selling books. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did want to get that out early before I forgot. Cause you Thank know, you, Tim. Forgot <laughs> <I'm scared. laughs> there you go. Hey, so guys, we're going to go ahead and dive in our episode. Like I said, stick around because we've got some great content coming your way today. And Katie's going to do a longer uh, little exposition about uh, selling books and what that looks like and how to go about it uh, later on. But right now, we're going to jump right into the 101 with my man, Tim. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first day of school. Welcome to the... Uh class we like to call glass is in session uh this is the 101 today i know a lot of you have been asking about packing and shipping and uh, i know that you guys have i've been throwing a lot of stuff at you as far as glass goes early into these episodes even though i do resell everything obviously um my background is in glass porcelain and ceramics uh, i figured the best thing to do i mean 101 is if you're going to start reselling, you got to learn how to pack things. Um, and it can be very discouraging if you start early on in your reselling career or if you're just now starting to sell glass and, you know, you you sell that first piece, you pack that first piece, that first piece gets to the buyer and it's broken. And that can be very discouraging. And the last thing I want everybody to feel is discouraged. I want everybody to feel like you can do it. 
Um, it's just a matter of, you know, practice. And, you know, it's taken me, it took me, uh, you know, a good year before I, you know, finally mastered uh, the packing of, of glass. And, you know, a lot of that goes into it. And every item is going to be different. That's one of the, the loop or one of the struggles that you're going to face along the way. You know, you might have a piece of glass that's this big. You might have a piece of glass that's this big. It might be a funky shape. You never know. So it's always going to be like, okay, which box is this going to fit in? You know, how many pieces of bubble wrap am I going to need to use? You know, how, how do I charge for shipping? So I figured it would be very smart for me to kind of give you guys that first basic push of how to pack a, you know, let's say, we'll say small size or regular size piece of glass to kind of get you guys started uh, in that direction. So I put together a little video clip for everybody, uh, and I'm going to show you all how I pack a small piece of glass. And cue video, roll it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here at the Over the Years Shipping Department, and we're going to show you all how to ship a small to normal size piece of glass. I know a lot of people are said that they have been scared to sell glass because they're worried about the shipping aspect of it. I'm going to show you that you can do it and not be worried. All right, so up is going to be this absolutely beautiful Fenton Glass Country Cranberry Fern trifold rose bowl um so this just recently sold in my live sale which is every monday night at eight o'clock p.m eastern standard time on the over the years youtube channel so i'm going to show you guys how i am going to pack this rose bowl all right first you can you want to get up you can get Come a little, little closer. closer yeah so first what we're going to do is is we're going to wrap it in packing paper um Generally, I, I try to cut a piece that works. All right. Then we are going to wrap that piece up. And we're going to tape it up. So now we're going to use some small bubble wrap. And I'm only using one sheet because of the quality of the next step, which includes the big bubble wrap. All right, so now we're all wrapped in small bubble wrap. Next up, we will be using the special bubble wrap that I uh, buy. And I'm sure we'll probably try and put a link for this in the description of the um, the video. Uh, this is the best big bubble wrap in the world. It is non-poppable. Like, what do they call it? Vapor? Vapor? I don't remember exactly. Yeah, what it's, it's got the word vapor in it. But yeah, so the best part about this bubble wrap is that it, it, go, it goes into these size pieces. So now I can do... Take two pieces of big bubble wrap and And there we go. Bounces like a ball. No worries. Now I'm going to show you how to put it in a box. So generally what I'll do is, is I want to weigh how much this weighs in the bubble wrap to see if I'm going to put it in a box that will ship first class or non-first class. So this already weighs 12.6 ounces. So this is going to go priority mail. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use one of these free boxes from USPS. Right. 
One of the most important things about shipping any sort of breakable that a lot of people undervalue is how you tape a box. It's very important to make sure that every crease is taped to avoid the box uh, exploding, for lack of a better word. All right, so now that that's done, we're going to use recycled newspaper to fill the box. So as you can see, we have now filled the base of the box. We'll then take the item, put it in the box. And the next step is you want to fill the voided areas in the box. So that will be four sides. So one, two, three, four, and now you want to fill the top. Well, let me show you that first. So you see how it's nested in there. Now you're going to fill the top, which will also help fill a little bit more of the side void on the side. Now your top is filled. You will now close the box. Once again, you want to make sure you hit every single crease, especially on larger, on larger items that you ship. One of the creases that most people forget about is this side crease right here. So you want to make sure you get that one and we're all done. That's how you pack a piece of glass in that smaller to regular size shape. As you get more comfortable, you'll be able to ship larger pieces of items with the same sort of technique. And we'll show you some of those techniques at a later point. But hopefully this guys, this will help you guys and you'll find it helpful and allow you to source more glass items. So thank you very much. And now back to listening and loafing. Tim, I'm not saying I'm not still scared of packing glass, but I, I'm a little bit, have a little bit more confidence after seeing your video. Yeah, uh, you know, and seeing how you do it, uh, packing with the pros, you know, my man Tim. Next up, we got Jimmy with what's trending. Go, go. What's going on, everybody? I am the last person you want to ask what's trending. I mean, black t-shirts, <laughs> basketball shorts. I don't know. Like, I am definitely the old school flips hat. I don't know. Um, but I was able to come up with a category that is definitely trending right now based on my sales, like the stuff that is flying off my shelves right now. It's the holiday season, right? So, like, holiday decorations, holiday collectibles, ornaments, that stuff is trending right now. Now, it's kind of a... For me, it's a fun, it's a different topic. Like it's a difficult topic. Like this stuff does sell year round. It does. It definitely does. But the sell through rate, the prices, they all go up this time of year. I myself hold these items for this time of year and it's paying off big time. And so I'm just going to go over some of those items that I've been selling recently on eBay that, I mean, this in the last week, this stuff just flew off the shelf. Um, vintage stuff is the theme here. Vintage stuff always does well. Very highly collectible blow molds, guys. Um, like these, this is like three feet tall. This is a Frankenstein blow mold right here. Um, I mean, this thing's worth over 200 bucks. So if you can find these blow molds, um, at estate sales, yard sales, even at the thrift, they pop up at the thrift as well. You should always look for them. There's all different kinds like this reindeer one, another one. This was made popular by Christmas vacation. All these reindeer and the Santa, when he kicks them and kicks them through the yard and he's after his lights don't work made famous people want these blow molds because of that they want the santa and the reindeer in their front yard another blow mold this one was smaller this one's only like two feet long another 200 plus blow mold right here so keep an eye out for blow molds people are on to it but you can still find them and you can pay up for them if you pay 50 dollars for this blow mold and sell it for over 200 that's still really good profit so keep an eye out for blow molds i can't i mean i, I know the community knows about them really well um, and you know what? Watching Tim's great shipping video on glass, this is a video we need to do, shipping blow molds. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it can be done. And it, if you do it right, it's not that hard. So 
that's a video I'm going to consider for the future is packing these blow molds up in these big boxes. But there's also smaller stuff like these stackable jack-o'-lanterns like this. They're also considered a blow mold, but they're a little bit smaller. I mean, this is a $40 uh, decoration right here all day, and you can pick these up for a dollar, two dollars all the time, at, especially at thrifts and stuff like that. So, and then the last thing I want to hit on, because this is something that I really love to sell, are these animated dancing, singing, um, either Halloween, Christmas, any holiday themed. Like these even go to Easter. They go to all the holidays. Um, these things sell like crazy, you know, and I find them all the time. Jemmy is a really good brand with a G, Jemmy. So I'm always looking for these. They fly off the shelf for me. I mean, this this Dracula, I think he sold for over $40. I've sold one of these animated mummies from Jemmy for over 100 bucks. So always keep an eye out for these. Now, I do say look them up. Some of them aren't worth as much. But if you can get them for cheap, they can still sell for $15 to $20. So animated novelty type dancing, singing plush are also a really good thing to um, this time of season, they um, the holiday season, they really start to move. So check it out, guys. Holiday stuff this time of year. It might be a little bit late for the Halloween, but Christmas stuff is really starting to move right now. Awesome. We appreciate it. Yeah, blood molds. I've actually sold a Santa and a, a reindeer. And, and I'll tell you my uh, packing hack. Shipping center. Shipping center. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's not a bad idea. Get to know your local shipping center. <laughs> like, I brought it in there. I dropped it off. I paid them twenty bucks. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> like, I, I might could see if they let me film in there at some point. They probably would. But uh, yeah, we appreciate it, man. Blow molds are a cool thing to pick up for sure, and they're out there. Uh, it, you may have to just do a little drive by people's Christmas decorations. Like, do you want to pick these up, or you know, you want me to? pay you for them or what you want to do. Okay. All right. We're going to get right into a deep dive with my man, Sir Nog. Hey, everybody. All right. So we're deep diving today. I, I do a lot of vintage shirts and I just got back from West Virginia Vintage uh, Fest and that was a lot of fun, but I'm going to teach y'all some, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into some clothing tags. So a lot of your vintage stuff have clothing tags that you can kind of identify, hey, is this a good tag to be picking up? What's, you know, what's on it? So I'm going to go through some tags. So look, boom, look at all these tags. Like, you know, you can see, you know, uh, I, I can see some like really fun tags. So we're going to deep dive into a few, uh, probably a few of these tags. Um, we're going to be like, we're going to talk about Harley, Nike, Champion, and then some rock band uh, tags you should be looking for as well. So let's jump into like Harley Davidson. Like, you know, how many Harley Davidson shirts, you know, you see, I'm going to show you the ones that can go for some serious money if you find the right kind. And that's called 3D Emblem. 3D Emblem. Harley used to do uh, 3D Emblem uh, shirts in the 70s and 80s. 70s, 80s, and 90s. And um, listen, there's some of these 3B emblem shirts I've seen sold for thousands of dollars. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is definitely uh, what you want to look for, especially um, the first two, uh, like the screen printed ones. Um, you know, Fort Worth, Texas, made in the USA. Uh, we'll talk about single stitch on another episode as well. But we're just talking about tags today. So if you see, a Harley shirt with a 3D emblem, definitely you want to be picking that up. Definitely you want to be doing some research because they are uh, very collectible. And again, I've so I've sold Harley shirts for two, three, four hundred dollars, uh, you know, a piece, just depending on if it's the if it's the right one. So definitely look out for these 3D emblem uh, when you're picking up your Harley shirts. All right, next we're gonna jump into uh, sports. Nike, okay? Man, Nike makes so much stuff, but I'm going to show you some of the tags for the crazy vintage. Now, when I talk about, like, when I'm, when I'm showing these tags, some of these shirts are, you know, $100 and up. I just sold a Nike shirt that had the blue tag on it. If you see, not, uh, so if on the bottom row, you see the the uh, the pinwheel. 
the pin, the Nike pinwheel is very, you know, that's like a holy grail. Um, and then you'll see the sportswear one, uh, all made in the USA, and then the blue tag one. Um, these are your older ones. These are the ones like we come across millions and millions of these shirts. You know, like oh, you know, even the white tag or the silver tag. These are the ones that can garner a lot of money. Uh, so definitely uh, take a look at these. Um, I, I found one that just had Nike on it, blue tag, easy hundred dollars. Listed it, had it listed for two days, sold it. So definitely uh, when you're looking for Nike stuff, these are the vintage Nike tags that you're you're definitely gonna uh, want to look out for and pick up when you see them. Same thing with Champion. We'll, we'll bounce over Champion. Champion has a lot of uh, different ones, and I did not put uh, the, the most famous tag, the Reverse Weave. Um, but, yeah, revert Champion Reverse Weave, uh, you, you know, you, you find it out there. Now, Champion has made a comeback, um, you know, like, you know, in fashion, but they've kind of died off. But Vintage Champion is still uh, very, very popular. So if you're going to look for a Champion, look for – uh, the two tags I just showed right here, the champion, what we call that, the champion running man, and the champion blue bar, like the light baby blue bar. Uh, those are the ones uh, that you're going to want to find. And then your reverse weave. If it's made, the, you know, you want to make sure it's made in the USA, reverse weave. And you're going to see a lot of, like, colleges and sports stuff on your stuff too. So uh, that's something definitely. But there's so many tags for sports that we're not even going to get into to today because that could be a – Literally, we could have a six-hour show just on tags. Okay, yeah. so uh, we're gonna get we're gonna uh, we're gonna drop into band tees. So band shirts are super popular. I sold a, I sold a bunch of band shirts this weekend. I sold I saw a bunch of band shirts being sold. So these are the these are the tags you're gonna want to look for on your vintage band shirts. And we're gonna go we're gonna harken all the way back to like seventies bootleg. 70s bootleg, uh, stuff like Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, uh, had two tags. So if you see this fantasy tag made in Pakistan, that's a very, very popular uh, tag for like 70s. I've only ran across a handful of these because, you know, when you're talking about 1970s shirts, you know, some of us old timers are like, oh, it's 30 years away. Nope, that's 50 years ago, some of these shirts. Uh, and also this hand, hand text. Uh, hand text uh, from the 70s as well, okay? Now, we're going to look at these Brockham tags. Brockham, late 80s, early 90s. So look for the Brockham Group, Brockham Worldwide, made in the USA. They did a lot of stuff for Guns N' Roses, Metallica. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, a lot, a lot of bands uh, have, have used these. A lot of, think about, when you think about Brockham, think about like that Seattle grunge, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains. You know, you're going to find a lot of them on a Brockham tag. So that's one you want to definitely uh, be on the lookout for uh, when you're going through. Like, you know, when us clothing buyers, when we're going to the racks, we're, you know, boom, 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 boom. So one tag, if you know these tags, you see it. Oh, it stops everything. And you pull it out and you take, and you take a look at it. Uh, next up is your... Um, is your liquid blue. And I'm actually wearing liquid blue today. Look at that tag right there. Boom. Liquid blue. Okay. Made in the USA. A lot of Grateful Dead uh, stuff. A lot of Grateful Dead. Rolling Stones. The cool thing about liquid blue shirts too, they had the big all over prints. As you can see, the, the crazy graphics. You come across these, there's some serious money. And the non-band liquid blue shirts that have like, Dungeons and Dragons or, uh, you know, like kind of like, a, you know, just different weird artwork all over prints. You definitely want to pick those up. Uh, so, yeah, Liquid Blue made in the USA. Now, you will see some uh, shirt, new, new, newer Liquid Blue shirts that are printed on just the shirt. You want to look for the hanging tags. Hanging tag made in the USA because Liquid Blue is still putting stuff out. Um, so you want to look for those hanging tags that uh, made in the USA. And then the last one, th when you're looking for band shirts, the giant, okay? The giant shirt. Uh, the, these are some of the, you know, the, the tags you want to look for. You see, like like I said, you're clicking through shirts. 
Th this tag will stop me in my trails. Now, again, not every giant tag is going to be a home run $100 shirt, but you definitely want to pay attention to that because these tags all are almost as, um, you know, like are, 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 are almost as valuable as the single stitch. Okay. Because you can kind of, with each tag, you can, you can date that tag and it kind of gives a provenance to the shirt. So those are the tags. Um, yeah. Like if you want to, you know, screenshot it or there's a lot of references y'all can uh, use um, for these. Uh, I mean, you, there's Pinterest boards just made for these tags. So if you have one tag, say you have a Woolrich tag on an old jacket, there's, there's 10 different, you know, throughout the years, there's 10, 15 different Woolrich tags that they have used. And you can use all, you can, you can find that and use that knowledge to date your piece. So if you're going to go vintage seventies, vintage eighties, vintage nineties, or whatever you'd like, it'll help you out uh, in dating it and, you know, making a title for it as well. So that's our deep dive. Like I said, I could go way. I mean, listen on just the Nike tags. I could spend, a, I could probably do an hour show on just Nike tags and Nike shirts. So, it's a, it's a it's a mini deep dive. We 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 got our shovels out and we started digging. But listen, that hole can get pretty pretty deep. So um, yeah, I just dip, dip dipping our toes in the pool. Yeah, we're Ooh. dipping our toes in the pool. Take but take that information and do your research. If you come across these tags, there's there's people that do champion tags from 1940s to today's date, and they'll show you all the tags so you can kind of go and look to see if one of yours matches that. So that's my deep dive. We appreciate you, Sir Knock, man. I mean, I know, like I've seen those Instagram posts where it's just like one specific tag and there's a hundred, like you're like, man, they've changed it every couple of years. So yeah. it's definitely important to do that. I know for me mm -hmm. being a, a baby vintage uh, clothing reseller, like I know more hat tags than I know shirt tags, but Shirt tags, I, I usually shoot a picture to Cernok and say, hey, what's this? <laughs> like, <laughs> if it says made in USA, I will tell you this. I'm starting to get a little feel. Like you can feel some of the shirts and know that it's a little different. You will, yeah. Yeah. We appreciate you dropping the little knowledge mini bomb going on. But, uh, hey, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and jump into our reseller hacks with my man Leroy. <laughs> Okay, everyone. So on this episode, I'm going to talk about things that I use for cleaning. Everybody uses different things. I like to use um, an air compressor, which I have my air gun here. I also like to use different kinds of foam spray. This is actually one of my favorite. This is just a different kind of foam spray. You can use bathroom foam spray. You can use tire spray as well. Uh, scrub and bubbles. You want to use something that's not too harsh. I've used um, oven cleaner and that's a little harsh. Um, I'm going to do a little sample for you guys and just give you an idea of how it works and how I do it. So it's just one of my tools. You can see how dirty it is. And I'm just going to spray it with the scrub and bubbles. You usually don't have to put that much on, but you can see it doing its work. You can see it bubbling. And if you looked close, you can see that the white is getting yellow. So what it's doing is it's pulling all of the dirt up. It's pulling it up. So then I'll just get a little scrub brush that I use. And I can see all of the dirt just lifting right up. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can do it, wipe it down, and then do it again. Um, I use this on hats. I use it on, like, for my own personal hats. I use, I've used it on my hats. Um, get used to it and get used to the, the chemical that you're using before you do it on something that you might be afraid of. But I use it on um, name, you know, tags and stuff. And I usually don't have a problem. Um, I'll spray it again. And you can see it's it's just brown. It's just coming up brown. Then what I do is I actually get my air gun. 
And I just clean it right up. Look how nice and clean that is, guys. Look at this side. Nice and clean. It's really that easy. I use an air gun for a lot of stuff. You can use it for sneakers, the bottom of the sneakers. If you don't have one, it's okay. But if you see one at a yard sale or you see one, you know, at, at an estate sale or anything like that, I would grab it because you never, ever know when you could use it. If you could dig a little small pancake ones, mine's a small one. It's sort of quiet. You can hear it in the background. But um, they'll kick on once they fill up. Um, and I just, that's something that I use every day. So I can, so I can, you know, clean my tools and stuff like that. I can get the, I can get the rag and now and just wipe it if I wanted to. Um, but that's what I really, really like to use. Um, and even with the foam spray guys, I'm telling you, when you go to the estate sales and you look in the cabinets over the, over the uh, dryer, washer and dryer, you'll see this stuff. You'll see it in the bathroom. They'll have 50 cents on it. I pay $4 for it. But sometimes, like some of these, I'll grab and I'll get them cheaper because I get I get to the estate sale and they're still there. So some of your cleaning supplies, guys, even like the little scrubbies, you can get at estate sales. So don't be afraid to when you once you look at all the good stuff or the stuff you want to resell, look and see if there's anything that you can use. I told you guys last episode. Thank you guys for watching this segment, and I'll see you guys next week. See ya. Leroy, man, we appreciate you uh, showing us that. Who would have ever thought that you could use tire cleaner to clean other things other than tires? Uh, so <laughs> we uh, we appreciate you uh, taking the time to to share your little hack with us on how you clean items with things that you would may not expect. So at this point, guys, we are, are long awaited. We're gonna bring in our guests and we're gonna do a. Kind of a mashup of all the things we just talked about. The 101, the trending, the deep dive, the all of this rolled up into one package with Miss Katie Reeds. We appreciate you. Thank you, Eric. Um, and again, congratulations, you guys, for hitting a thousand. I didn't say that in my intro. That is absolutely awesome. So if you are not subscribed, why not? You're already watching or listening. So get on it. Just subscribe. Click the bell. Do what you got to do. All right. So I resell used books. Um, I don't have a cute little segment name, so I'm going to name it Welcome to the Katie Reads Bookstore Cafe. All right. So today <laughs> we're going to be talking about the where and the what. Um, the where is going to be selling on eBay and uh, the what is going to be books. And then you're going to be either thrifting or pursuing free inventory. So I will put you on game with my free inventory very quickly. This is what I do. I create an ad using Canva, which is free. I put myself out there on Facebook and Craigslist and all the other different places. And I say, I will take your used books. And I'm very specific about the different um, type of genres that I want because over the years I've learned my lesson and you got to kind of learn your lesson along the way. But I will say, ask for nonfiction ask for vintage, ask for religious, um, things like that. Those types of genres sell better. I do a lot of X library. So I also sell um, old children's books that are no longer in print and very vintage. I sell those for high dollar amounts, but those you have to kind of seek out and get from a very specific type of source. So um, those were the categories that I highlighted in my very first ad and, um, and textbooks. That was another one that I put in my ad. And people will reach out to you and give you the books. Um, I suggest that you be 100% transparent when they ask you what you're going to do with them. I was. And uh, I would say one out of 10 people told me no once they found out what I was going to do with them. Most people just don't care. They just, you're a solution to a problem for them. And the problem is they have a crap ton of books that they want to get rid of. So you're a solution. So uh, that is the kind of free book pickup service that I do. Um, keep track of your mileage. That's a business expense. And um, 
talk to an accountant or your insurance company about what you can do as far as like car insurance and car maintenance and all the things that you have to do to pick up those books because that's you're doing a extra trip that you would not have done if it wasn't for your business and as far as going to the thrift store uh, Goodwill, Salvation Army, those are great. Um, but I also suggest getting to befriend the manager and talking to them and trying to get into the back room before things are um, funneled out onto the floor. That sometimes works, that sometimes doesn't. Um, I've found that I get the best books also at estate sales. Estate sale companies are focusing more on antiques, bigger items, furniture, the books they're going to sell for like a dollar or less. And that's actually where I found a book that I sold for $500 to someone in France. I got it for $3 at an estate sale. So that is something that I definitely suggest is utilizing estatesales.net. It's an app or a website, and you can find out all the estate sales in your local area. That is my go-to. And it's all year long. Estate sales aren't seasonal like garage sales. Um, and then finally, garage sales obviously are another place where you can find used books. Um, Church sales are my favorite because they have no emotional attachment. They're just doing a fundraiser. And most of the time it's pay whatever you want. So you can kind of dictate your price a little bit and um, get possibly inventory a little bit cheaper than what you do would at a normal garage sale. So those are the wares of finding the books. And the what, again, I would just suggest focusing on textbooks, religious items. I sell Bibles daily. Um, Bibles just do really, really well for me, um, especially the vintage ones. And I also sell a lot of old children's um, chapter books and um, picture books. Another thing with eBay, why I like eBay more than Amazon with reselling books is with eBay, you can do lots. Um, Amazon, you, you could technically create a listing and do a lot, but it's not going to probably sell as quickly as what it would on eBay in my personal opinion. Um, so what I'll do is sometimes I'll get a huge lot of goosebumps or wishbone or like all the classic 90 chapter books. And I can do a really big book lot of that and, you know, sell it for $50 plus. So without getting into a deep dive, like Sarnak, um, that is kind of like the overview of where to find books, what to kind of look for. And then in the eBay app, just keep it simple, type in the title, or if on the back they have a barcode, you can scan the barcode in the eBay app. Um, maybe that could be a segment for another time explaining how to scan barcodes and things like that in the eBay app. Um, and that's how you can kind of find the book, look up sold comps, which I think the show has kind of talked about already how to find sold um, listings. So uh, kind of using the knowledge from that, you can get an idea as if this book is selling. And then as you grow into your book world, or maybe you already have it because you're doing other vintage items and books is just something, an additional new category, I do suggest trying to get um, some type of subscription to WorthPoint that has caused me to be able to sell books as much as $90 because there was no sold comps on, list on eBay, but on WorthPoint, it had sold a year and a half ago. I listed it, it sold overnight for 90 bucks. So just kind of keep that in mind as well and uh, make sure it makes sense for your business and your business expenses. So that's kind of my quick overview uh, with books and where to find them and how to get them and um, where to list them. Hey, we appreciate, we appreciate you coming in and sharing that brief overview. I mean, for me, I'm taking notes. Like I, 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 I was too. Can I yeah. ask, can I ask a couple of questions? Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I, I have multiple questions, but I'll do one and I'll, we'll go around just so that I don't take 30 minutes asking questions. No. <laughs> how do you, how do you ship your book? So I always ship my books in a patented mailer. Always, always, always. Um, I don't just put them in a poly bag. My philosophy is they need to get the book exactly in the same condition that I listed it for. Um, I sell a lot of X library, which falls under the good and acceptable because they have markings and stamps on them. And honestly, a lot of people think they aren't sellable, but I sell them for $40 plus all day, every day. Um, so don't let anyone tell you X library doesn't sell. And so they're always going in a padded mailer. Um, and depending on the dollar amount, like I just sold a book for 150 bucks 
And that one I did put in a box, um, mostly also because I do the global shipping program and that's going to have a lot of stops in its future. So I like to kind of protect it a little bit more and because of the dollar amount. So that one I did throw in a box. Got it. So Amy. do you sell a lot overseas though? I mean, a lot of your books going out. Yeah. Um, so the $500 book that I sold, that one went overseas through the global shipping program. Um, that one, that book was from uh, 1901, 1900 or 1901. Um, and it was on mysticism. So that's why I tell a lot of people look for weird stuff, especially religious stuff, new age. Um, that book, especially like you have to think about the historical context of 1900 and having a book on mysticism that was like really taboo back then. You know what I mean? So um and I had the dust jacket for it. And that's kind of another segment all on its own. But understanding conditioning, understanding the importance of having the dust jacket and having everything, um, you know, sometimes books have maps in the back of it. Just all the things that can potentially get lost over time. If you have all those things still and it's a very old book, uh, mm -hmm. you're in a good position to get more money for it. What about cookbooks? I do rock with cookbooks. Um, so, but old ones. Um, old ones. So, yeah. Joy of Cooking. I uh, the the cookbooks that I sell are almost always vintage. Very rarely. Every now and then, the trending diet, you know, keto stuff like that. I might find some and um, flip them, but they're usually your bread and butter, like fifteen to thirty dollars sales. Um, so the vintage ones sell for a lot better. Joy of Cooking. I'm always on the lookout for that one, especially when it has a dust jacket. Okay. Now, what about uh, my biggest thing is because, you know, I deal a lot with vintage and antiques. Right. And like for me, sometimes dealing with books is kind of like dealing older books is kind of like dealing with artwork. Right. So like it's it in the sense where it's kind of difficult to know, is this a um, first edition for, you know, mm. in the book world versus like a reprint or a print. So do you go by the publication date? in the latest publication date in the book is that yes. always going to be the determining factor of when how to date that book yes correct um so like some of the vintage children's books that i get it was published in 1930 but the version that i have is from 1964 so the copyright's going to show 1930 because they haven't changed the pictures they haven't changed the text but it's a reprint and maybe the cover's different or something like that it's a different cover art so um, you have to list it as 1974 because that's when it was reprinted. Um, so that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. First editions, um, mine technically was a first edition, but it was maybe like the 30th reprint. You know what I mean? Because they've reprinted it multiple times, but it's still a first edition because there was no change to the text or the illustrations or anything like that. So certain editions, um, are, are based on was there a material change to text or illustration or the actual content of the book. Now reprints are like they sold out and had to print another batch or they did new cover art or you know that type of thing um, or they did like a, a remix for the books. That type of okay thing. last last question I swear. <laughs> All right so like i kind of think about it too because i always try to like when i'm learning something new or like i'm intrigued by something i try to relate it to something that i do or i know right mm -hmm. so I, i'm kind of looking at it like now from this standpoint with books like in comparison to like sports cards right is mm -hmm. there like a certain like time uh era or genre or you know like books that were mass produced that you kind of like want to stay away from kind of like junk wax from, you know, the nineties mm -hmm. sports cards, even though there might be a few from that era that, you know, can, can garner some good money. Is there something that you kind of stay away from in that respects, like romance novels from like the nineties? Like, is that, yeah, you know, I is there can't, something I like can't that? pay people to take my romance novels. Now with that said, there's certain ones by certain authors. Like the, I still take the time to look some up, but like Danielle Steele and your Harlequin romance. I mean, that's a dime a dozen. Even the vintage ones are a hard sell. Um, I will say mass market paperback books. The abbreviation for that is MMPB. So you'll see that a lot in like certain listings. Um, mass market paperback books 
are mass marketed. <laughs> like they are your your standard paperback books that are literally on every Walmart shelf or Target or whatever. And even back then when they were printed, like maybe it was early 90s. The 90s is kind of a weird era, especially when it comes to nonfiction. Like I, I recently did a um, free book pickup for a hospital. And in my video, I was talking about how a lot of this material is from like early 2000s, late 90s. So it's too old to be relevant now, but not old enough to be like collectible to a doctor to where they want to have that on their bookshelf because it's maybe, you know, maybe they were in cardiology and they want some old cardiology books. So it's like the 90s and early 2000s is kind of like an awkward stage. I kind of talk about that in the video with nonfiction. Now, as far as fiction, um, I fiction can sell any era, in my opinion, but your mass market paperback fiction is just going to be like just your a dime a dozen. Hardcovers always sell better. Books with dust jackets always sell better. First editions obviously always sell better. And then you've got the weird stuff like Harry Potter where they accidentally didn't do J.K. Rowling. They did her full name. Um, so random gems like Needle and Haystack. You're, I don't think anyone would find that necessarily out in the wild. But um, random stuff like that error printings, you know, just all those weird things. Um, and then I would say like anything 70s and older, even with children's books now, I'm taking a second glance because a lot of them are just completely out of print. That publisher is out of business. That illustrator passed away and they have no other work out there anymore. Like even down to the illustrator, I'm learning. I'm still learning books, guys. <laughs> Even down to the illustrator as being someone heavily sought after, which kind of goes into like photography and art books kind of too, like the certain photographer or the certain artist. So um, sometimes it doesn't even matter about the author or maybe the content. It's more about this illustrator did those illustrations and they're looking for that illustrator. So um, yeah. I hope that answered your question. One more quick question. It doesn't have to be crazy. <laughs> For, foreign language. Foreign language oh. books. Because I, I come across a lot of foreign language books at estate sales that are vintage. Specifically vintage French books. Yeah, I what, would snap those is, up. Um, Worth Point is my go-to when it comes yeah. to foreign language. Um, just because obviously with eBay, you only can see so far back with sales. And then with Worth Point also, like I can see, Worth Point is going to show me eBay, A books. It's going to show me a bunch of different websites. And I like that. Um, Google Translate, using Google app to translate, that helps me figure out. Unless it's Spanish, I don't know what I'm looking at. So I use Google Translate all the time. Um, and I recently sold a old Pinocchio book in Greek for 75 bucks. And then I have some old Greek um, textbooks that I'm trying to figure out what to do with them because they're children's textbooks from like the 50s. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to lot them or sell them separately. And then I sold a couple um, books that were in German and they're like tourist books. Um, so I sold all three of them as a lot for 40 bucks. So, um, yeah, foreign language. I don't get it all the time, um, but it does sell really well for me. Now, when it comes to like certain foreign, foreign language books, because of what I do with my free book pickup service, anything I can't sell, I work with migrant worker communities. And one of my friends is the head of that. So if I get certain Spanish books or um, other types of fiction that I think would be appealing to like the migrant workers, then I'll give that to them. I won't try and sell it. Am I giving away money potentially? But um, for me, my business thrives because of my community relationship. So that's just something I choose to do. See, all right. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, I'm done asking questions. Right. I could go on for like an I hour. I with our questions. <laughs> once I learned something, I go like I fall into this rabbit that's hole. Good. I'm right. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's I, I, I do have a question. Sure. So, I I don't sell books. Oh, I, I I've sold a few books, but I, you know, but <laughs> someone like getting into it and like, hey, I want to sell books. What's the one thing you would say? Don't do that. Like, don't do that. Or like, um, you can just don't like give like the good piece of advice for something like because you can go down a rabbit hole with books, you know. Oh yeah, like, 100%. Else. So there's like you know with clothing and hats. There's there's certain things I'm like yeah, 
I wish I wouldn't have done that. Or like, or I tell new resellers, stay away from that stuff. So what would you tell new resellers, you know, that want to get into books or are able to get books? What are things don't, don't to not do? Um, understand media mail. Comic books are not media mail. Um, certain ephemera are not media mail. You need to understand the policy because it's a very good, nice program for you and your buyer. But you can't put in a little card in there that says, thank you for buying from my shop. Like media mail is strictly the book. That's it. Like they will open the package and look at it and charge you more. I promise you they will open the package. The times that you think you're going to get away with that, I promise you they will open it. Um, it's happened to me twice It in the beginning. It happened to me twice and I learned my lesson with that. Um, and then another thing I would say is kind of understand, if you're going to dive into textbooks, you do need to kind of understand how to tell a fake from a real textbook. There are fake textbooks out there. So um, this actually happened to me. It's in one of my super older videos, but I was at a Goodwill bin store and I found a textbook, scanned the back of the barcode. It was selling great, probably a hundred dollar profit, but I opened it up and the inside was literally upside down. The text was like off center. It was a fake textbook. <laughs> um, and they wow. get over here into the US. It's really, really heavy in India, but they do get over here. And so that's something that you're always gonna wanna look out for when you're getting into textbooks and stuff like that. There's even lawyers that will purchase textbooks off Amazon and try and bust people for selling fake books. Mm. Like It's really nasty. So be careful with textbooks. I always approach them with caution, but it's good money. It's kind of seasonal because of the college scene is buying during certain times of the year, but it's good money um, if you can find them super cheap. And then another thing um, I would say is Understanding conditioning is different on every platform. Amazon's good isn't the same as eBay's good. Um, so understand conditioning of books. I have videos about that. And then also understand like literally you will never list a book for new. Please do not list books new mm -hmm. unless it is literally wrapped up and you got it from the <laughs> publisher or you got it directly immediately from some source that can verify it's new just don't list it as new because the likelihood of it genuinely being a new type because when you you also have to understand your market your market is like probably collectors or people that are taking these books very seriously so when you say something's like new and it's got bumps in the corner and it's got a dog-eared page and i mean they're gonna lose their minds okay so you have to just be very um, conservative with your conditioning, I would just say, you know, under promise and over deliver. Um, acceptable books sell for me all day, every single day. So don't feel like you're missing out if you're not conditioning up. Um, I would suggest conditioning up. Man, there's so much to learn. I, I, I have a question too, <laughs> because you kind of touched about it before the show. How do you decide what platform to sell? Oh, like decide question. which so, book goes on which platform because for new sellers, I think that's really important. Yeah, so I, I did make a little video about that because I had just started getting into whatnot. Now, whatnot has media mail, so that's life changing. But mm -hmm. I always uh, go eBay slash Amazon first. My Amazon store is changing, I'm focusing more on like RA and OA with Amazon, so I'm looking at different products for Amazon now. So for eBay, um, I am looking up eBay first. And then if that's a no go, then it's um, going to whatnot. I do sometimes, depending on like how vintage the book is, I will list it on Etsy, but I'm trying to focus Etsy more on like my crafting and the things that I do with different um, media that I get through my free book pickups. I try to only utilize free inventory for the crafting that I'm doing. So I have a way of kind of like monetizing on things that maybe wouldn't sell on eBay. So it's going to eBay and then it's going to whatnot. Um, and then, or I'm dabbling a little bit with wholesale. I have a lot of people that reach out to me and maybe it's a $10 profit, but I'm trying to be more at like the ASP of 15. So maybe it's like a big book lot and I'm selling that to people. So I'm using wholesale for that because a lot of people have reached out to me. They're like, I want to dabble with books, but I want to buy from someone I trust and you know, or I don't have a lot of thrift stores by me or whatever the case may be. So I'm kind of going back and forth between whatnot and um, wholesale. I will say whatnot um, gets a lot of my like 
lower uh, sale priced books because I'm selling them really cheap um, because they're, I'll bring my free inventory there. So I'm selling them for like $2. I mean, obviously sometimes they will bid up sometimes, but I'm selling them really cheap. So, um, and now with media mail, it's just a really, really good deal for the buyer. So those are the three platforms right now that I focus the most on. Now, I know this because I did a little research, but I know, you know, not only do you do books, but I've seen where you upcycle stuff for Etsy. Yeah. Like, um, I, I've seen some of that. Could you like just share a little bit about that? And I'm going to drop your link for Etsy as well um, okay, as your you. eBay store so people can talk. Yeah. So um, Golden Books, I was getting a lot of those and you can sell them definitely three to five dollars a piece plus um, shipping. But especially now that I'm a full-time reseller, my time, I have to factor in a lot of things now. And so I need to be at a certain sale price. Um, so what I started to do with those instead, just because I needed kind of like an outlet <laughs> a little bit, and um, it's a little sentimental. My grandma that passed away, we did a lot of crafts with her and things like that. So I had the idea to turn them into book journals. So what I do is I cut them up, I um, add some blank pages to the book. I rewire them with new binding and I sell them as book journals. And junk journaling is like the new scrapbooking for or like millennials and younger. So junk journaling is like really, really hot and popular, obviously, on Etsy. And so I sell a lot of my book journals there. I recently decided, hey, why don't I do this with VHS cassette tape? covers like mm -hmm. there's tons of vhs that i get that i can't do anything with um so i double checked with my lawyer friend and i don't have any copyright issues so i started diving into that and so the spines the side of the vhs cover i turn into bookmarks and then the front and the back i rewire it add some blank pages and turn it into notebooks um that's and so then awesome. what that's so awesome Thank you. And then all the library, the ex library books that I get through my book, free book pickup, I always make money on those because typically in the back of the book, there is a checkout card. And I have some from like the 60s, the 90s, the 80s, the 70s. People love it. It has been my best seller. I am the top seller on Etsy, which I recently found out um, for that product. And I literally just take them, laminate them with five mil lamination. So it's really sturdy, cut them down and sell them as bookmarks. And people absolutely love them. So I'm really, I've been doing that for a year now. Um, Tay finally gave me like the final push last year and was like, just do it. Just laminate yeah. them and do it. So I I did it and it's been, it's been going really, really well. I've been making TikToks about it, putting myself out there on social media about those products. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback. And I made a lot of sales that way. So um, I guess all that to say, like, even when you're getting free books and it feels like maybe um, you're not making any money off of them, I've still found a way to, like, monetize my free books, give back to my community. Like, obviously, my time matters. These are time-consuming things. So it is kind of like a part-time thing that I do. Etsy is definitely part-time for me. Yeah. But it's enjoyable. I'm also getting like a therapeutic release from it as well, which is really cool. It gives me the same kind of enjoyment as like um, thrifting. So, and it saves me money. It makes me money instead of spending money. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, and then I make a lot of different bookmarks with all types of different um, stuff. I get a lot of books that are really worn down um, and have cool pages or cool pictures inside. So I make bookmarks out of those. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, look, we uh, we know, um, you know, obviously we've held, had you for a, a while on the show. We obviously want to respect you guys' time. Uh, I had an opportunity to hang out with her and Tay and their children uh, mm -hmm. over the Press and the Prophets. So I know that, you know, the little one, I'm sure Tay is uh, occupying right yes, now. Yes. <laughs> <So, laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. Uh, we do appreciate you coming on. Uh, we Thank normally you. do an extra Q and A segment, uh, but guys, we're actually going to drop your questions in. Uh, we'll get to you next week for sure. And uh, we uh, do appreciate all everybody for being here today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, spin it around one more time. Uh, like I said, we we so appreciate Katie for being here with us today. And I'm going to be dropping her links down below for her eBay, YouTube. 
Etsy, like get your bookmarks, get your like, you know, we're uh, we're all about I, I definitely enjoy so much hearing uh, the fact of upcycling and helping your community and and those kind of things. Uh, one of the ideas we have going forward that we're actually going to push uh, later on. But uh, this holidays are coming. Um, I would encourage you uh, buy from other resellers. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like it's one of those things. Uh, all these guys, their stores are all down in the links below. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, check out like for me, that's one of the things I'm thinking about for, for my family this year is I'm just going to shop my friends, man. I'm going to shop yeah. other people in the, in the eBay Bay community. Let's uh, why not where we are, you know, like a loose family <laughs> for the most part, mm -hmm. like, we're not blood related, but uh, honestly, the people that I have on my show, um, I've so enjoyed having, uh, the extra time to spend, with the guys that are here every week and meeting Katie and hanging out with them. So, uh, uh, guys, uh, we're going to spin around and, uh, let everybody give a little outro. Uh, Jimmy, we'll get you. Uh, I just want to thank Katie so much for coming and hanging out with us and giving us that information. I always say when someone has good information like that, they're giving you some, she just gave you guys a lot of knowledge. I really appreciate that. And you guys, uh, everybody, thank you again. Um, I, I, every week, I feel like I learn so much just being on the panel. So thanks. Sarah Don. Hey, it's, it's always a, a great time here with everyone, you know, with Eric, Tim, Jimmy, Leroy couldn't be here today. But Katie came in and just dropped some big knowledge bombs on books and everything. So thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for the support and everything, you know, like, Hey, we're, we, you know, we're spending our time, you know, giving you all this knowledge and it's, it's great to see a lot of people, uh, you know, that, that are, that are really like diving in and, and watching the videos and, and learning something from us. So, yeah. So hopefully we can, you know, keep, keep it up, keep it going, you know? There you go. Well, that Katie go. <laughs> Uh, guys, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really, really honored. I really appreciate it. Congratulations again on the thousand. Um, this show is going to definitely take off. It's what resellers, it's what I needed back in 2019. So it's absolutely amazing. Um, tons of resourceful information. So thank you guys for doing this, putting it together and making it what it is. And um, yeah, anyone that has any questions further about books, you can find me on Instagram as Katie Reads, and I will um, do my best. I do have a whole life and kids, but I will respond as soon as I can and um, try and help you guys out. And uh, just thank you so much to everyone that already knows who I am, that subscribed to me, that supports me. I don't take it lightly. It means the world to me. And um, I'm just... You know, maybe the Katie Reads Bookstore Cafe will make another appearance on the show. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, we, we do appreciate you so much, Katie, for being here, uh, for sure. And, you know, guys, what we're trying to do here is not only just help educate the community, uh, but also bring people that, you know, we all have different things that we're into and then look at things from a different perspective. So it's always nice to, I, I mean, I'm a lifelong learner myself, so I've got a whole page of notes like Katie, just from what you had to say. And then I'll see the other guys on the panel every week. I learn, even though I hang out with these guys a lot. So I know some of what they already know, but every now and then some stuff comes out that you're like, where'd that come from? But uh, and we're going to let Tim take us out today. So Tim, final words. Yes. Once again, uh, just shout out to everybody who's, you know, become part of this uh, reseller information network family. It's super important for us to be able to give out this information uh, for free uh, to give back to the community. Cause at one point in every one of our, you know, reselling careers during our path, we've relied on information from somebody else. So it's always important for us to be able to give back to the community as a whole. Uh, this was probably one of the craziest episodes so far. I mean, we've, I know we've only done a few, but I mean, like we literally touched on so much information yeah. from the blow molds to Leroy's hack to learning how to ship glass to the tag information from Cernok and to like, obviously we could have probably done two hours just with Katie in the books mm -hmm. because of my multiple questions. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, listen, it's, this is what it's about. It's about being able to soak in this information and being able to do it while having fun and, and just 
being very direct, no loopholes, no beating around the bush. Like this is the information that we have. We're giving it to you. Um, and, and please continue to drop questions. If there's something else or another guest that you guys are interested in that you want us to bring on to kind of like dive into another world or, or another category that maybe nobody knows about or, or that you're interested in that you think that we might be interested in, we're always open to learning. And like I said, in when I started this episode off is to always keep an open mind because me personally, there was a point in my reselling career where I was like, there's no way I would ever sell books. And then I sold a few books and it opened my eyes. And then there's people like Katie out here that will help you change your mind. And that's what it's all about. It's all about adjusting and adapting. That's the only way that you're going to continue to be successful in reselling is to open up other avenues, open up other doors, and most importantly, opening up your own eyes. Um, so Definitely a big shout out to everybody on the panel, everybody who's watching, everybody who's subscribed. Uh, we appreciate all the love and support. And don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend about R I N Reseller Information Network. Doo -doo 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 -doo. We'll see you guys. The uh